Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Good morning and welcome to today's virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Jonathan Curiel and I'll be your moderator for today's program called Bitcoin in the Middle East. The digital currency is becoming much more popular around the Middle East and this program will analyze that from an economic perspective, but also a political and a cultural one. This is a member-led Middle East pro, uh, forum program of the Commonwealth Club and the next one is October 28th at 3 p.m. It's called Pathways to Peace Through the Lens of Interfaith Youth. You can go online to commonwealthclub.org for more upcoming events. And uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speakers, Alex Gladstein and Fadi El Salamin. They'll uh, each speak for about 10 minutes and then we'll take questions. And we'll begin with Alex Gladstein. Alex is the Chief Strategy Officer of the Human Rights Foundation and Vice President of Strategy for the Oslo Freedom Forum. He's also on the faculty of Singularity University. He's an advisor with Blockchain Capital and he's co-author of the Little Bitcoin Book. Uh, welcome, Alex, to the Commonwealth Club. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. So just to zoom out a little bit, what's important to understand about most parts of the world um, is, is that there is a broken financial system. Most people don't have the dollar. Most people don't have a working easy bank system where it's seamless to just Venmo a friend or pay somebody back. Most people have trouble sending and receiving money to their family. Most people live with a currency that, that actually rapidly loses value uh, or has stringent restrictions. So for people in America or the UK or Japan, you know, we live in a little bit of a bubble. Only about 12 to 13% of humans live in a country that has both liberal democracy and property rights. Uh, as well as a reserve currency, which is basically a currency so strong and desirable that other central banks want to save in it. So you're talking the US, the EU, Britain, Canada, Australia, Japan, pretty much. Everyone else in the world, the other nearly 7 billion people live under either an authoritarian regime or, or a weak currency. So the important thing to just reconcile with immediately is that money's broken for most people around the world. And that's certainly true in the Middle East. Um, we're going to go quite deeply into Palestine in this conversation. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a somewhat of a unique situation, but there's a reason why Bitcoin use is skyrocketing there, e even in Gaza, which you may find hard to believe. And, and I, I can detail how exactly that happens, but it's a wider uh, regional phenomenon. Um, Turkey may be the place in the world that has the highest per capita Bitcoin use of any country. From what we understand, uh, there are millions upon millions of Turks using Bitcoin, you know, in a country of 100 million people. Why? Well, number one, the country has 15 percent inflation officially. Price inflation is much higher. Um, so think about the fact that your earnings and wages and pensions are just losing value rapidly. Like you could see it happen. Uh, there's also capital controls in Turkey. Uh, and then if you disagree with the government, you run the risk of the, the government freezing your bank account. And in Turkey, I mean, we're talking a government that has jailed tens of thousands of lawyers and teachers and judges. J just, just, you know, if there's the slightest bit of suspicion that they belong to a particular kind of religious kind of sect, let's put it that way. Um, so there are reasons why people are turning to Bitcoin, which is a currency that no government can control. Um, at its root base level, it's beyond the corruption and manipulation of any corporation or government. Yes, the price goes up and down all the time because it's a 24-7 open free market that, that anyone can get involved with. There's, there's no way to regulate the price of Bitcoin in that way. But at the end of the day, that asset itself can be sent and received from anyone in the world uh, with nothing more than a free and open source uh, wallet that you can download on any Android or iPhone. So anyone who can use social media in the world uh, which is the vast majority, can use Bitcoin. And that's what you're seeing. So, you know, again, we're going we're gonna to shine a spotlight on, on Palestine 
in this particular conversation. Um, and I'll, I'll try to tee up Fadi. <laughs> it's, it's great that we have him here to, to, to talk more about some of the economic issues uh, in, in Palestine. But again, the, this is a wider regional phenomenon. Um, in Lebanon, uh, obviously, you've seen the worst, uh, I believe it passed Venezuela. It's now the worst, um, worst performing currency in the world. Uh, complete dereliction of duty by the leaders of that country, a bunch of thieves, essentially. And the country's collapsed. There's, you know, food shortages, there's electricity shortages. Um, but, but kind of worst of all is that the currency is just completely in free fall. So people have turned to both Bitcoin um, and Tether has, has ways to protect themselves. Tether is basically um, what they call a stable coin. Um, Tether is, is, is sort of like a, a euro dollar in a way. If you know about that, um, a euro dollar is a, is a dollar created outside of the purview of the Federal Reserve. So euro dollars are dollar denominated accounts uh, that, that exist in Europe and, and beyond. So a stable coin is basically like a less regulated version of a euro dollar. So it's available to Lebanese you know, who don't need to show their ID to get it. They exchange actual banknotes uh, for Tether, which are, which are dollars, basically, US dollars. Um, and then once they have the Tether, some of them buy Bitcoin, some of them do other things. But in Lebanon and Palestine, it's important to point out that Tether actually is like a, an on-ramp into this digital new digital um, space uh, where citizens, again, can access both dollars and Bitcoin uh, in a way where they don't have to like have a particular passport or particular um, set of ideas or, you know, a particular nationality or, you know, even a particular bank account. No, they don't need any of that. They just need a phone. And that's, that's incredibly powerful. Uh, just to color in a little bit of why I think it's so important to discuss Palestine, the political um, repression there is quite detailed and always discussed in a vivid way and in an important way. Um, but the economic side is often ignored. I mean, there are exhaustive reports about human rights violations in Palestine that come out and they don't even talk about the currency. But the fact is that over the last, um, since 67, uh, the outcome of Israeli policy, and we could debate the intentions, but the outcome has been that both the West Bank and Gaza have become in increasingly dependent on the outside world, both f on Israel for, for labor and for capital, uh, and then eventually post 93, uh, on the broader outside world for foreign aid. Um, and they've been less sovereign and less uh, depend dependent, right? So even though the population of Palestine has grown a lot um, over the last few decades, uh, and even though technology has improved a lot, um, the, the number of people working in manufacturing and agriculture actually declined, okay, in, 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 these, in, these, in West Bank and Gaza. So what ended up happening was that the military occupation uh, and then later, the, the sort of, you know, PA led state in the West Bank, they became increasingly dependent, and they couldn't stand up on their own. And they have no economic base to speak of. Um, and what has happened is basically what what one scholar calls a uh, sort of like a sort of de de development. So it's like, it's like a shrinking economic capital base, but a right more, 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 more people. So what you've actually seen there in the last 20 years is like, I mean, right after the second intifada, there was a economic depression that was worse than the great depression of the United States, but it happened inside Palestine. And a lot of this relates to this dynamic, especially in Gaza, where you have a shrinking economic base, more people then more restrictions from the Israeli side. So how do you make money? Well, you go to Israel to work. Well, what happened after the second intifada? Well, Israel made it a lot harder for you to work in Israel. <laughs> so like the only way you had uh, to make a living that was like removed from your, from your options, let's say. It crushed a lot of industry inside Gaza, especially. And then you have war, right? So war absolutely is, is catastrophic in Gaza and has destroyed all the infrastructure. So people have less resources and there's investment has fled completely. No one wants to invest in Gaza. I mean, it's not like you can like, invest in real estate there and make a lot of money. Um, so it's very bleak. And, you know, I think people in a lot of parts of Palestine uh, think that tomorrow is going to be worse than today. And that's, that's kind of sad to think about, but it's true. And it drives economic thought. And at the end of the day, a lot of this is because of economic 
vanishing economic opportunity as, as a result of Israeli policy, um, to be quite honest. Um, so I, I figure we'll start there and we can get into the stories of why and how Palestinians found Bitcoin and how they're using it, what the plans are, are, are for it. But I'll leave, I'll leave you with that as my opening statement, Jonathan. Yeah, th th thank you, Alex, so much. And just uh, for, for people watching right now, um, if you Google Alex's name in Bitcoin Magazine, he has a really well-researched, well-reported also um, piece on, on Palestine in particular that gives a lot of the context to what he's talking about. Um, I would encourage you to read it after the program because <laughs> next, next we have uh, Fadi El Salamin. Um, oh, by, by the way, before I introduce Fadi, you can submit your questions um, for the Q&A that we'll have shortly after this via the chat. Um, now now on to Fadi El Salamin. Um, Fadi El Salamin, uh, as Alex mentioned, um, is a um, uh, prominent figure in, in Palestine. He earned his master's degree in international relations and economics from Johns Hopkins University. He's a graduate of Seeds of Peace, which is a peace building and leadership development organization. Uh, he's an adjunct fellow at the American Security Project. He's also a very successful business person. Um, so in that sense, uh, like Alex, he's, he's really a Renaissance person who has uh, knowledge about so many different things, inclu including corruption uh, in Palestine. He's, he's actually received death threats uh, for his work there. Uh, let's welcome Fadi to, to the Commonwealth Club. Fadi. Thank you, Jonathan, and thank you, Alex. It's good to be with both of you. Um, I'd like to start by just putting a little bit of perspective from the political and socio-economic side of what Alex pointed out. Um, as most people know, the Palestinian uh, population remains under a military um, occupation. Um, but below this military occupation is a brutal Palestinian authority that is very heavily entangled um, via common interests with the Israeli uh, establishment, whether intended or not. Um, the entanglement, believe it or not, crosses from politics to economics. And once you get into the economics of it, um, a lot of the politics starts to make more sense. For example, many Palestinian citizens who uh, require permits to enter Israel for work will, um, are being shaken down or need to pay uh, a bribe to some of the Palestinian politicians. In order to pay, if they don't pay the bribe, their, um, their permit would get revoked on security grounds. And so 16 years into the current president's uh, rule, we find that almost 84% of Palestinians, both in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, believe that the Palestinian Authority is corrupt. Uh, more than 79% of the Palestinian population have called for the current president to resign. And as most people noticed, um, we, the Palestinians were supposed to have presidential elections as of July 31st, but because of the corrupt political environment, the president was able to manufacture a reason to cancel uh, the elections indefinitely and sort of uh, stay in, in, in power. If you ask the average Palestinian um, about the financial uh, status of the current president and his circle, they'll tell you they're either millionaires or, or billionaires, um, their children, uh, more or less control most of the commerce within uh, the Palestinian territories. Um, if you so much as you want to make a wire transfer from outside to inside, if it's meaning from the diaspora into the Palestinian territories, once it passes the Israeli uh, regulatory body, if it arrives on the Palestinian um, authorities regulatory, regulatory uh, body, um, you will be asked for either a bribe or be asked all sorts of questions where um, not only you, but also your um, financial assets are at, at risk of uh, obviously of extreme corruption. So what Alex proposed is, um, and what Alex discusses is for somebody like me who've studied the corruption um, for the past 10, 11 years and have seen uh, the sophistication in the different schemes that exist within the Palestinian Authority to um, really milk the population of, uh, and when I say milk them out of all sorts of money, I'm talking about 
uh, levying heavy, heavy taxes on basic products like tobacco, like meat, uh, like bread, um, so that the fat cats, as we call them, are uh, finding themselves in a much more favorable position to import uh, foreign products and sell them locally at a high price and the tax is shifted to the local population. So you're talking about um, an authority that has no control over money supply, no control over inflation in its economy, uh, unable for lack of competency, but also for lack of just basic monetary uh, physical policies and monetary basic needs, unable to really print money or regulate uh, the economy. Uh, also, Alex maybe will shed some light on this. Uh, terrible, terrible agreements like the Paris Economic Agreement, where um, almost basically every single good, every single dollar that comes into the West Bank or Gaza, uh, part of it goes to the Israeli government. And a whole list of, of reasons why Bitcoin um, gives me a huge sign of hope, uh, not just for the reasons mentioned, but also going forward, if we are going to think in a serious way with the international community to circumvent the corruption within the Palestinian Authority, to circumvent the um, economic entanglement with the current Israeli occupation, we need a system that promotes um, Bitcoin, a system that, and what I mean by this, my idea or my vision is to have a development bank that focuses on, uh, regardless whether the politics moves or not, but focuses on implementing uh, large scale projects for the Palestinians, whether it's roads, uh, hospitals, universities, and so on, but adopt the Bitcoin uh, system so that we not only promote economic freedom, but also circumvent corruption and so on. I'll stop here and uh, let Alex kind of dive more into what we discussed earlier about the, um, the benefits of Bitcoin in Palestine and also the, how uh, the you know, agreements like the Paris Agreement and others have stifled the economic development uh, within the Palestinian territories. Th 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 thank you, Fadi. Um... I'd like to, uh, let me remind uh, people watching that this is a virtual Commonwealth Club program called Bitcoin in the Middle East, and we're speaking with Fadi Osalamin and Alex Gladstein. Um, please feel free to um, <clears throat> submit questions in the chat. Um, I, I referenced uh, Alex earlier your your Bitcoin magazine piece, which gets into the Paris Protocol and why that is so undermining for the Palestinian economy. Um, but I, 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 want, I want to ask uh, uh, this question, though, because that article um, uh, be, begins with an interview um, with a um, man by the name of Ukabe, but it's a, it's a, it, he wants to be anonymous. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, both you and Fadi have talked about how Bitcoin, and granted, it's sort of in its inf relative infancy, how it's a way to circumvent um, layers of control, occupation, uh, uh, and, and, and economic control. Mm -hmm. And yet people you interview, Alex, they want to remain anonymous. They, they don't want their names out there. So still, even, even though Bitcoin is, is designed to do that, it's mm -hmm. still in a sense, um, a secretive, uh, um, act of economic activity in that sense, or is it, am I, am I misreading this? Yeah. Well, um, some of the people I interviewed, uh, spoke on record. Um, some of them did not want to be named. Uh, and I think that's fair because governments, whether it be Hamas or the PA or Israel, they're not going to like Bitcoin because it takes, uh, their control over the economy away from them. Um, it's pretty simple. So it's, it's fair for people to want to remain quiet. And one of the major reasons that you listener have not heard a lot about the impact that Bitcoin's making around the world is that most people who are bene benefiting from it in difficult political climates don't want to go to the New York Times and talk about it. Like, like it's a private financial matter. Like if, if you are a Nigerian working in the United States and you've received this incredible opportunity to send money directly to your family in Lagos uh, instantly using Bitcoin without having to go through the financial system. I mean, you're not, it may not be something that you rush and go tell everybody about. It just may be something that you, you kind of privately personally upgrades your life. So I think it's quite important to understand that a lot of the most incredible stories about Bitcoin are, are hidden 
and they need to be dug out and you need to go report and you have to go talk to people. It's just not, it's not going to be like what you just Google immediately. What you Google immediately are like Wall Street and Silicon Valley people getting into Bitcoin and making their own cryptocurrencies and making all this money and then losing all of it. And that's, that's, that's certainly part of the story, but it's, it's a very small part of the story when you, when you zoom out and you think about the fact that there's probably today, based on exchange data um, and on-chain data, meaning like the blockchain itself in Bitcoin, probably close to 200 million users of this thing. Now, and, and, you know, most of those people are saving, simply saving in it. They're not, they're not buying groceries with it. Most are saving, but that's how an asset monetizes if you look at the history of money. First, it becomes a store of value, then a medium of exchange, and then a unit of account. So we're very much in that um, era today where it's, it's, it's becoming a medium of exchange in some places, but it's still mainly a store of value. And that's certainly the case for Palestinians. Um, a lot of them just use it sort of as a sovereign um, bank account. But I, I, I would say one thing that's important to note just for this Palestinian story is the psychology. And I definitely want to hear Fadi talk about this, but what does it mean that you're forced to use your oppressor's currency? I mean, that's psychologically quite damaging. I mean, for a population to be forced to use Israeli money. Like when you look down at the banknotes, they're Israeli money. It's not Palestinian money. And the Paris Protocol, which we referenced, is part of the Oslo Accords, happened in the early 90s. And the, the, long, the, the short version of it is the following. Uh, the occupation used to be profitable for the Israelis uh, in the 70s and, and early 80s. They actually made money off of it because they could harvest the resources there. Um, but the first intifada, though, while, while, while widely seen as unsuccessful, was actually successful in making the occupation expensive um, due to resistance. I mean, due to the, the two ideas of the, of the first intifada in the late 80s were self-sovereignty, um, we're going to boycott the Israeli economy, and then we're going to do it ourselves. We're going to grow our own trees and fruit and produce and, and farming. That was the idea of the first intifada, was economic self-sovereignty and financial freedom, really. Um, now, uh, Israel did not like this. The Israeli government, the military, it, got, it made things quite complicated for them. So they basically did a deal with Arafat. And the economic piece is so important because it's the only reason the Israelis agreed to give like statehood, quote unquote, to, to the Palestinians, was that they would still have economic control. And they still, as Fadi explained, to, to this day, control all of the flows of money in and out. They take a tax. They, dic they get to determine the goods that go in and out. They control the banks. They control the money. So they control the people and, and the, the independence, however, we, I know it's quite debatable um, and, and co contentious and controversial, but whatever independence the Palestinians have is, is somewhat fake because they don't actually control their own money. And it's actually written into this protocol, which was supposed to be changed by the end of the 90s, but still hasn't been changed, that, that it's literally written in there that they, they cannot have their, their own currency. Um, so again, a lot of Palestinians are like, enough of this. Uh, I'm going to have, I'm going to choose a currency that's that's not owned by any government, and and that you know is 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 a peaceful way of protesting essentially. Um, and one more thing I would say that's really helpful for the audience is like maybe because Fadi told me about this, and I, I think it's really helpful, Fadi, just for you to explain what it's like to just if, if you're in America, just to send money to Palestine. Like, can you can you just break that down for us? I found that very illuminating. Like, forget for Bitcoin. me, it's a nightmare. If you, if you, because, if you didn't know what, yeah. if you didn't know what Bitcoin was, how would you do it, right? Normally, I would try to send a wire transfer. Others would try to do um, Western Union or some sort of similar Western Union. But but even the wire transfer, it's so complicated. It takes um, for you know it takes it longer than average. Um, it has to pass through the Israelis um, and then the Palestinian Authority. For somebody like me, who is openly uh, anti-corruption within the Palestinian Authority. Any wire I would send into the Palestinian uh, territories would be flagged as a security issue, quote unquote, where the person, even if it's my own lawyer, I remember wiring a payment to my lawyer in Ramallah, where she was brought in and investigated by the Palestinian Authority, um, why she was getting uh, paid. And even though they know what the case was and it was something related to the PA. So it's not as smooth, uh, easy um, process where you just send a wire tr transfer and that's the end of that. Uh, on top of it, for people in the diaspora, especially like Palestinians who live in America, um, 
I, I know that this was a very common fear, uh, especially for those who wanted to help um, disadvantaged families in Gaza or in the West Bank, worried about being labeled with the wrong labels, uh, worried about being approached by even the US government. Why are you trying to help? Who did you send money to in Gaza? You know, it, it's a whole list of, um, you know, it, it's a list of fears that, that are um, the, hanging there uh, with every wire transfer. So. Um, I, 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 the security concerns, I, I mean, I don't know how this would be addressed in a Bitcoin world, but maybe Alex could, could speak to, but obviously the, the rest um, are concerns that are clearly, um, you know, the ramifications of a dictatorship, uh, ramifications of an authoritarian regime like that of uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Alex? Well, yeah, I just would also want to point out that um, zooming out, most People use Bitcoin again as a store of value because their local currency is not very good in, in, in an emerging market kind of context um, or authoritarian regime context. Um, it's a little different for uh, Palestinians, right? Because you're like, wait, but they get to use the shekel, which has actually outperformed the dollar in the last 20 years. It's been a quite a good currency, right? The issue is, and it's counterintuitive, but there's actually dramatic price inflation in Palestine, even though they have a, like a stable currency. And I'll explain why. When you buy a laptop in Tel Aviv, um, it, the good comes into Tel Aviv and it's sold in Tel Aviv. When you buy a laptop in Ramallah, the good it still comes into Tel Aviv. Then it has to sit in a warehouse. Someone has to pay money for that. Then it has to be inspected. Then it has to go on a truck. And then um, a lot of them get stolen along the way or pilfered. And by the time the laptop already makes it to Ramallah, there's been fees after fees after fees put on top of it. So a laptop that might cost $1,000 in Tel Aviv could cost three thousand dollars in Ramallah, even though it's even though it's when I mean when I say three thousand dollars, I mean in shekels, right? So what you actually see is, despite the fact that the Palestinians and and a lot of Israelis will say this, they'll say, "Well, we gave you we gave you stability, we gave you the, the shekel." I mean, and then they say, "Look at Lebanon," and and that's a that's fair to an extent, but you have to understand that like because of the way the occupation works, there's dramatic price inflation in the territories, like dramatic, like. Again, a laptop that costs $1,000 worth of shekels in Tel Aviv may cost 3000 in Ramallah, um, and those wages aren't going up very high. Um, another thing I would say just for the audience to think about is the digitization of society and what, what that's, what's that going to mean for Palestinians in the future and for others in the region. You're basically going to have an incentive structure by the PA and the World Bank and the IMF to go towards a digital currency, like a state digital currency and maybe there will be a palestinian currency a digital one okay but it'll be controlled by the pa and by the un and the world bank and whatever so this currency will give dramatic powers to the pa currently like one of the only ways that people actually find freedom in in the west bank is through cash like through the informal economy like they use paper money they use cash to do things to do all kinds of things and the government doesn't know and you know what a lot of people consider them thieves and crooks and they don't want them to know if you remove cash from a society, you remove that you're removing freedom and privacy. Like imagine, Fadi, if all of the cash economy in, in Ramallah, in the West Bank, was all of a sudden replaced by a government controlled digital credit that was on your phone that could be frozen, confiscated, blacklisted. That's coming. That's going to happen in the future. Children born today will not use paper money when they're 20, 30 years old. So we really have to think about the ramifications of that. And that's why, again, I share his hope about Bitcoin because. It is digital cash and digital gold. I mean, it's it's it is an asset that's digital and easy to use online that is is beyond the control of the government, and and I think that's very very important. Yeah, I, if I if I can interject one yeah. thing here, um, and these are really really um, salient points you're making. Um, the program is titled Bitcoin in the Middle East, but um, people in Yemen. I've read stories of of people in Yemen using Bitcoin. To um, there, there's a huge uh, hunger issue in Yemen, uh, and so uh, people are using Bitcoin. At least one person is that I read about to support families. Um, to support families there, um, there are people uh, elsewhere in the in the greater world. Let's say in Afghanistan, who are recognizing Bitcoin's importance and the way it gives them leverage over their own situation. Um, this is, I think, is is what you're talking about. So it's not just Palestine we're talking about. We are talking. Right. The, the greater Middle East and 100%. the greater world and the greater world. Well, look at Egypt, the largest country in the Arab world, uh, has seen a dramatic currency collapse in the last 20 years. People lost. I mean, 
I wouldn't say they lost everything, but they lost a lot. Now, in Syria and Lebanon, they did lose everything, right? So just in the wider Middle East, you see countless stories of currency collapse amidst conflict. And, you know, Bitcoin really does two things for people. Again, it's like a store of value. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a sovereign savings account that's uh, debasement proof. Like no government can just print more of it and devalue your, your Bitcoin. Um, and the second thing it is, is it's a censorship resistant payments rail. So the latter piece is important for places like Yemen or Syria or conflict zones. Again, I, I mean, I would encourage a listener to think about how they would, how would they get a hundred dollars to their friend in Yemen right now? <laughs> like who's trying to feed someone or like, good luck. I mean, it, it's sanctioned. There's, you know, God knows how you would get, how many days, weeks it would take, it would even get through. All of a sudden now, anyone in Yemen with a smartphone can receive any amount of money from you. We don't have to go through the banking system. It, this is a beautiful technology because it connects us. It builds bridges instead of walls. We have so many walls in the world, especially in the Palestinian context. What this is doing is it's connecting Palestinians and, together and allowing them to collaborate outside of these artificially imposed walls that, that our rulers are making. And, and I think that that's a really unique force in the Middle East. There, there are not that many other meta concepts or kind of social tools that can do this. Um, you know, even the internet was, was highly manipulated and it, it had great hope, of course, and, and it still does. I mean, a lot of the protests in the West Bank now are, are, were ignited this summer by the fact that people had smartphones and they could take photos and share videos. So it's still very important, but you know, look, the internet has been, has also been used by authoritarian regimes against the citizenry. So all of a sudden we, we now have a technology that's, it's kind of, uh, it's like the genie's out of the bottle and it's, it's hard for an authoritarian regime to like use it against the citizenry. Like, <laughs> like the more they use it, uh, the more like the people who work for that government learn about the fact that there's money that the government doesn't control. It's like a mind virus that sort of spreads. So it's, it's spreading right now. Uh, and as you just said, it's, it's to the great benefit of people who are like stranded, cl closed off, whose money is broken. This is, this is something that, that Bitcoin fixes. Excuse me. Let, let me ask you this, though. Um, you, you got into Fadi, especially like how difficult it is to transfer money, say, to Palestine. If you Google Bitcoin in the Middle East, the first thing um, you get is um, um, it, uh, you get the Google saying, oh, people also ask, is Bitcoin legal in the Middle East? That's the first question. Then the second question is, how do I buy Bitcoins in the Middle East? <laughs> and so we, we know, I mean, Bitcoin, I remember back in the day, this is like five, six, seven years ago, yeah. maybe $3,000 a Bitcoin. Now it's, I believe it's trading around 60,000, 63,000. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. People don't have that money to send, but explain if you will, let's say I have a thousand dollars or $500. How do I, how do I still get into Bitcoin and then send it to relatives in Ramallah uh, and elsewhere? Sure. Well, the most important thing to know about Bitcoin is that one Bitcoin is subdivisible by a hundred million units called Satoshis. So there's no such thing as like Bitcoin being too expensive. You can buy a micro fraction of a penny of Bitcoin if you wanted to, if someone agreed. Um, and people commonly send small, small payments, a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars. Um, a few years ago, Bitcoin was quite limited in this regard because, you know, at, at its core functionality level, it it takes about 10 minutes to 20 minutes to 30 minutes to settle payments. So engineers were like staring at this and they were like, hmm, this is really going to be a problem for the emerging world where we need instant payments for retail. Um, and we need fast, cheap payments also. Like sometimes Bitcoin fees uh, can get quite high, you know, several dollars, right? Which, which, is, which would be unacceptable for a payment of $10, $20. So engineers built something called the Lightning Network. And that's really what's having a huge impact in places like the Middle East, it's starting to have an impact and it's going to really be quite pivotal over the next five to 10 years. Lightning Network is a layering technology that sits on top of the Bitcoin blockchain that allows you to send Bitcoin instantly and essentially for free. Um, that's huge because a lot of the criticisms of Bitcoin, which were good criticisms before, were that it was slow and expensive. So that's really been um, addressed. And, and when, you, when you talk about functionally, well, how, how can you buy it? Well, you would go, you, you would go to... Uh, a website I would encourage listeners to go to like Paxful is a, is a good example. Paxful is an American company founded by someone of Egyptian descent named Ray Youssef. Um, and if you look at Paxful Palestine, you will see 
all kinds of offers. And it's like an eBay, basically. People go and they post. It's a, it's a peer-to-peer marketplace. There's also one called Local Bitcoins, which is very popular. Then there's all kinds of local Arabic first platforms, okay, all across the Middle East. People go onto these sites and they buy and sell. And you basically, let's say if Fadi's in Ramallah and I just sent him 100 bucks of Bitcoin, he got it right away, like instantly. What he does is he just goes onto his account on Paxful and posts the 100 Bitcoin. Someone will buy it from him. And what ends up happening is within minutes, he gets a bank wire, a bank wire of $100 worth of shekels into his Bank of Palestine account. Um, and then he, the, there's an escrow service. So he sends the Bitcoin to the Paxful website. Paxful holds it. They wait for the bank wire to, to hit. And then they release the Bitcoin to um, the seller. So this way, within minutes, uh, Fadi can, can, tran- can transmute the $100 of Bitcoin I just sent him instantly into money in his bank account. This is really where the rubber meets the road for, 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 for like adoption globally. This wasn't happening five, six, seven years ago. It wasn't, wasn't this easy. But now there's just like tons of liquidity, buyers, sellers. It's just very easy to move in and out. So I think that's been really um, a big story. Uh, excuse me. Th- thank, you. thank you for that. I want to uh, uh, remind our audience that this is a virtual Commonwealth Club program called Bitcoin in the Middle East. We're speaking with Alex Gladstein and Fadi El Salamin. We're also taking questions from the audience. And one question that's just come up is uh, whether Hamas uses the shekel in Bitcoin in, in Gaza. Uh, I don't know, Alex, Fadi, um, either one of you want to answer that? And then actually, I think a, a natural follow-up question is, um, uh, you know, what, what, are the, what are the possible uh, peculiarities or dangers in the sense of Hamas? Um, and, and even, you know, the Palestinian Authority, Fadi, you talk about um, corruption there, um, them uh, uh, issuing their own digital currency and getting in on the game, as it were. I, I think Fadi can answer, but I'll just say quickly that... Uh, this is important to note that Bitcoin is neutral. It's an open and neutral technology like email or the internet or the cell phone. All the bad actors will use it also. And that's just something that you need to know. And guess what? Did that stop us from developing helicopters and mobile phones and roads and public service? Like, no, it it doesn't stop us, but we do need to know that bad actors will use mobile phones and email and Bitcoin doesn't mean we should stop innovating in these areas, but, but we do have to recognize that this is the case. Um, however, what I would say is that at least at, at the moment, people are like front running bad actors. So like currently the amount of Bitcoin that Hamas uses from what we understand is minuscule, you know, compared to their shekel and dollar activity or gold activity or however else they move money in and out. And the same can be said for any dictator in the world that may change and it probably will. But for now, the, people use the existing financial system to do to do their crimes. I, I think it's a good question. Um, and, and so, Alex, the question becomes, do you create a, a regulatory body to keep uh, bad actors from benefiting from a system like this? Or you just keep monitoring the bad actors regardless and uh, obviously keep the currency, um, the digital currency um, away from any type of regulatory body? I, don't I mean, look, it becomes regulated, right? So in America, for example, Bitcoin's very regulated. It's treated as a commodity. You have to pay capital gains on it. Um, you don't have to pay anything until you sell it at the moment, but that's quite restrictive for a lot of things. It means you can't really use it as a, as a day-to-day currency in America right now. Because every like, let's, for example, say you got some Bitcoin a few days ago and then you wanted to buy coffee with it. You'd have to pay capital gains tax when you when you sold it. So until so in some countries like El Salvador, they've changed the law. So it's, so Bitcoin is now legal tender in that country. Um, so you don't have to pay capital gains when you when you're moving in and out. But um, you know, I would say it's it's it, Bitcoin's very regulated. Each country has its own regulations about w- what to do with it, and the international financial system will certainly try to keep Hamas out however they can. Um, and, you know, just because the currency changes doesn't mean that the restrictions will change. They will still, re- it's all about the goods and certain, you know, Bitcoin's just money. It doesn't do, it's not anything beyond money, right? So Hamas, like, is still going to need to try to buy stuff from somebody. Guess what? Israel is going to continue to put restrictions on goods coming in and out, right? So just the money will change. So, for example, like, someone told me, this guy I interviewed, um, who went by the name of Ukab, uh, he said Bitcoin was like a checkpoint that was always open. 
um, because it allowed him to connect with anyone around the world in a way that, that he can't with anything else, like with anything else, food, um, water. I mean, there's, you can, there's no clean drinking water in, in Gaza. Um, anything else has to be brought in from the outside world, right? And you rely on the Israelis to allow it to come in. Or, or Hamas on the other side to, to not steal it as it comes in, right? So there's the two, two, two powers that be, right? And the people are stuck suffering underneath, right? So again, this just allows people to have that, that direct connection. But 100%, in my view, like, and I sound crazy probably, but I think in 50 years or way sooner than that, most likely, everybody will use Bitcoin just like everybody uses the internet. Like it won't be like something that we moralize about. It'll be obvious like obviously we're going to use the good money like uh when you have bad money and you have good money the good money wins i mean it's like when the british went into what is now new england uh, the natives used wampum like basically belts made of shells well guess what the british had gold it wiped them out when the french went in with their precious metals to west africa the natives used glass beads guess what the french money was was better was more valuable wiped it out even countries that took a silver um, standard historically, they didn't do so well against countries that took a gold standard because gold was harder money. It, was, it preserves purchasing power more. Um, and Bitcoin is digital gold. So, you know, it's it's not going to be something that, that we can prevent people from using, uh, in my opinion. Um, and we need to just be open about that and and we can take it from there, you know. Just to add a little bit to the second part of the question, what happens if a corrupt authority like the PA or, you know, take another example, like China creates its own digital currency? Mm. How does that affect monetary policy, trade deficits, devaluing, uh, you know, can they manipulate their own digital currency in terms of value? Or is that something uh, different from regular, you know, uh, money? Uh, You know, like the the whole issue of trade between, for example, US and, and, and China, I'm sure, uh, where the devaluing of the yuan, how it affected the balance, sure. of, of, you know, the, the balance of trade between the U.S. and and China and, and other countries, it, it, does that transfer as well into the world of cryptocurrency? The, the, so what we when we talk about a state issued cryptocurrency, it's known as a central bank digital currency. It's called the CBDC. Mm-hmm. Um, the only the, the main difference between most money, as you know, is all already digital, right? It's either like a digital deposit in a bank that banks create, right? Or it's a fintech account. It's like it's your money in your PayPal account or whatever. These are all digital promises to pay. Anyway, like almost all money is already digital. The difference between a CBDC is that it's not a liability of Wells Fargo or the Bank of Palestine or Apple or Google um, or PayPal. It's a liability of the central bank directly. So it's like, literally a promise to pay from the government from the central bank and the idea is that like it would give governments a more direct relationship with their citizenry it would allow them to do direct stimulus very easily with a touch of a button so you can imagine for the chinese government how interesting this is because they could let's say there was a downturn in the auto industry and there was like fear that the workers would protest they could like hit a button and just instant insta deposit like you know some stimulus into all the auto workers um uh, you know, CBDC accounts. So it's like the idea of having governments having more control over the money. So they'd be able to do things like expiration dates. So this would force people to spend. They, they could prevent savings. They could do negative interest rates much more easily, um, which obviously, again, prevents people from saving. Like a lo- what a lot of governments want to do today as we have these like just sort of this ongoing financial crisis um, is they want to prevent citizens from saving because they want them to spend. So they're going to have new technology to do so. That's going to happen eventually, you know, in, in most countries. I mean, it looks like more than 80 countries are already considering a CBDC. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you know, I think there's diminishing returns to some of this utility because, again, over time, citizens are going to use Bitcoin more and more for certain things. Um, I, 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 I would be very pessimistic if Bitcoin didn't exist because, what you described would be the reality. Like the PA would create its own currency and, you know, it would not, it would not be good for Palestinians because they would lose that privacy and freedom that, that the cash once gave them. And it would put them at the direct mercy of, as, as you've uncovered in your work, an extremely corrupt organization. Correct. 
Um, I, I have to say um, that in preparing for this uh, program, I, I, I knew enough about Bitcoin to have a lucid conversation, but not, not enough to, to engage with people um, really in the way we're engaging now. And so when I would see headlines, I mean, I'm a voracious reader. I read something in the New York Times by Robert Wexler, uh, who's former Democratic representative of Florida, and buried within this op-ed in the New York Times is um, this to me, which is big news. He said, I even spoke to Israeli ministers about the idea of Palestine, Palestinian railway connection to the port of Haifa that would offer Palestinian businesses ready access to transportation hubs and world markets. And when I read that, I thought, oh, this is huge news. Why isn't this a headline in the New York Times? Um, but Fadi, because of your work and uh, because of what I know about Palestinian society, um, it taps into the idea of, you know, a possibly corrupt, uh, as you say, corrupt Palestinian authority, and that this really isn't the news that I thought it was. F Fadi, can, can you talk about, because as we're speaking, there is a new Israeli government, there is new hopes for peace um, among Palestinians and Israelis. Can you talk about how the news coming out of Palestine and Israel um, may not be as, um, you know, sort of eye-opening as it appears? You know, I, I think it's uh, what you mentioned is a, is a good example. Um, there are every four years or every um, new administration coming in, new ideas get uh, proposed, old ideas get recycled, which is uh, similar to what you've just mentioned, basically linking the Palestinian uh, population to the rest of the Arab world via the port in Haifa or via another port down in Ilat. And um, some even propose linking it to towns like uh, Neom, which is being built in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh, but, but here's what, what gets left out of the conversation um, are important issues like sovereignty, um, the economic issues that we've covered so far. I bet you um, I've never had this type of conversation where uh, the economics of the Palestinian-Israeli com conflict are sort of unwrapped and explained. Um, because once you do that, you understand why it's not easy to link a railroad um, where you have no control over mon monetary policy, but not only no control over monetary policy, no control over goods and services coming into your territory before they're inspected and cleared by the Israeli, um, Israeli authorities. So that's what gets left out. People sort of focus on the one-liner, um, it would be great to link uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis. Yes, I agree, it would be amazing to have a railroad that connects everybody to everybody all throughout the Middle East. But um, I believe before uh, that is achieved, or in order to have that achieved, we need to look very seriously at the economic policies that exist, at the monetary policies that exist, and find ways to ease the restrictions that have been imposed by the different political agreements um, over the many, many years of of occupation, or even before, there are some mundane laws that exist in the West Bank that have been there since the Jordan monarchy, or even British laws, which is pre, you know, a British mandate. Um, you know, so so, but again, because of the corruption that exists within the Palestinian Authority, these are not a priority. The priority is to um, accumulate capital for the the you know, the, the top politicians increase their wealth uh, in any mean, by any means possible, but not, um, you know, for example, if you're a young guy who have a brilliant idea, I want to start a company in the spare of a moment um, to, you know, to take this, this idea out, you, you run into all sorts of laws uh, from the Jordanian, you know, the Jordanian uh, British mandate um, on company formations, for example. And so, these issues don't get covered in the in the news, but these are the uh, these are also part of the genuine obstacle uh, that uh, young people face in, in Palestine. Moving There's forward. also one other thing to mention is is that um, it's not just sort of geopolitically dependent or dependency that's been created of Palestinians on Israel and on foreign aid. It's also like within the West Bank, uh, you have people being dependent on 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 credit, like basically. Um, which is a relatively new phenomenon. Like there's no capital formation. Like, so what happens is I'm sure Fadi can explain, but banks, uh, you know, basically did reforms after 2007 that allowed people to take out tons of credit. Um, and, and all, and what people end up doing is buying fancy apartments and cars and, 
like when you're in some of these Palestinian cities, it's like, wow, there's actually quite a lot of wealth here. But there's not actual wealth. People are indebted. They're, they're in debt and they're, the interest that is charged on these loans is insane. Um, and at the end of the day, the Israelis benefit from that. The Israelis and the PA benefit from that. So there's, there's an enormous uh, cultural shift that's happened, unfortunately, where there's a lot of like kind of, kind of very high te- time preference spending happening on weddings and cars and apartments from people who don't have capital. So they're basically just making themselves slaves to, to, to the system. It's really sad. I mean, one of, the, one of the guys I interviewed for my article was a former banker who worked for a big bank in, that, that operated in, in Jordan and Palestine. And he, he quit because he was upset and disgusted with what had happened um, there. Um, so that's another powerful and important piece to this puzzle that that's, that's also a wider regional issue is in the last two decades, the increase of access to cheap credit has actually kind of um, forced people into, <clears throat> into this sort of um, uh, subservient uh, economic role. It's quite sad. True. I, I'd add just one or two more points to what Alex mentioned. I'll give you an example of how corruption um, stands in the way of, of development, especially in the Palestinian territories. For example, there are many affordable housing projects that were um, built with loan guarantees from the international community for the Palestinians to make affordable housing available for young couples so that there is an economic expansion. Because of the corrupt relationship between some of the businessmen and the government, public land was taken from Palestinians at a very cheap price and sometimes with no payment under the guise of public benefit, right? Um, you know, affordable housing projects. Some of these apartments were supposed to sell for forty to fifty thousand dollars to couples who are on a maybe thirty thousand dollar or twenty thousand uh, dollar salary a year. Today, these were the, this group were the uh, most excluded group from having access to these affordable housing projects, where the pr- apartment prices have gone to three hundred and four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars, and were being offered for sale instead of for the young uh, rising couples in Palestine. They're being offered for sale to. Um, Palestinians who live in the diaspora who could afford a four or five hundred thousand dollar apartment. They're being offered to Palestinians who live in Israel who have a highly, um, a little higher salary and, and more disposable income to apply towards uh, an apartment like this. So it, it's a, it, again, it, it's a very, very corrupt system that is built um, on alliances or and the alliance, um, you know, the common theme among this alliance is how to make the most money in the shortest amount of time from the most people with no regard to uh, public benefit whatsoever. Uh, th- thank you for, uh, for, for uh, mentioning that, Fadi. Um, we're we're going to take another question from, from uh, uh, the audience. And uh, I, I want to preface it by, by uh, talking about this um, article I saw in Coindesk uh, 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 website that says... Um, The next wave of crypto adoption in the region is likely to come from citizens in unstable autocracies or those facing crushing inflation in countries like Iran and Lebanon. Uh, The the question from the audience is, well, what what about Jordan and Iraq and Iran and Saudi Arabia and these other countries in the region? Um, Alex, can can you can you talk about that and how Mm -hmm. what the difference is between what we're talking about is happening in Palestine um, versus what what? could be in, and maybe already is happening, say, in Iran and Saudi Arabia and Jordan? Yeah, well, I could definitely speak to Iran. I've interviewed quite a few Iranian Bitcoin users. Um, Iran is, is one of the world's hotspots for Bitcoin use um, because of sanctions uh, and because of the collapse of the currency. So you have, again, kind of in a, a similar way to, to, to Cuba or Palestine, you have a, um, a, a, a corrupt authoritarian state that is additionally, you know, that that is hurting its people by abusing the currency. Um, Now, the abuse happens in different ways. Uh, Obviously, the Palestinians can't directly abuse the currency because the shekels, the Israelis control it. But in the case of Cuba and Iran, they they print the heck out of it, right? So what you're seeing is essentially um, 
Cubans have lost two thirds of their purchasing power in the last year as the peso has gone into free fall. Um, and Iran has experienced borderline hyperinflation uh, over the last decade. And that's enough suffering for people. What makes it even worse? I mean, that, that's, that's already too much for people to bear. What makes it even worse are additional restrictions imposed by outside actors. So what makes it even worse for Iranians is that they can't access the world financial system or buy stuff online or, or be like a normal person because of U.S. sanctions. Ditto the embargo on Cuba. So like, you know, outside sanctions plus internal suffering really, really makes things exacerbated. In the case of Iran, um, I mean, it's sim- same reasons, different story. People use Bitcoin as their bank account. They use it to earn. Like, let's say you're a software developer who works in Iran. How are you going to get your payment if you work do a contract for Microsoft? They can't pay you. It's illegal to pay you. They pay you in Bitcoin. Okay. I, I, I interviewed an Iranian woman uh, of this Iranian descent who lives in London. And her, her husband, um, her husband's father was sick in Iran and they needed, they lived in London and they, they couldn't get the money to him to pay for his medicine. Um, so they used Bitcoin. They, they had no love for Bitcoin. They didn't, they didn't, they, they had no ideological interest in it. It was merely the only thing that worked. And I think that's what you're starting to see more and more of as people turn to this thing, not out of, I mean, in the beginning of the internet, the earliest users were ideological. They believed in something. Okay. <laughs> the average person who uses the internet today. doesn't think about the ideological reason for the internet. They're like, Oh, it's the freaking internet. Of course I'm going to use it. Cause it's better than, uh, I'm going to use email because it's better than sending something in the, in, in the post, you know, like, obviously it's like, um, there were people who had, you know, ideological reasons for ma- many of mankind's greatest innovations, but those quickly get soon forgotten because you just simply use the thing for the utility of it. And that's what you're seeing today. Um, I, I mean, just broader, I mean, I don't have like, you know, we don't have to get into examples, but I can assure you, yes, there is increased, inc- dramatically increasing usage of Bitcoin uh, in, in all of the countries you just mentioned. I would just say that in the Middle East, the hot spots are really, uh, that I've at least explored, are Turkey, uh, the broader Middle East, let's say, um, are, are Turkey, Iran, um, Lebanon, Syria, uh, and Palestine. Um, other countries have, you know, slight, some of the other countries have slightly more stability and slightly more uh, currency stability, slightly. So there hasn't been, you know, quite as much interest, but I mean, again, like I mentioned, even in Egypt, it's, 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 um, something that is undeniable. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, Alex, uh, I want to remind audiences again, that this is a virtual Commonwealth club program called Bitcoin in the Middle East. And we're speaking with uh, Alex Gladstein and Fadi El Salamin. Um, you, you, uh, Alex and Fadi, you, you've spoken before. Um, you know, you've you've. Um, I, I'm just curious. What what is? How did you get to know each other? I mean, is it was it through Bitcoin? In other words, is, no. is this a Bitcoin <laughs> relationship, or or is it really um, something different? Is it really political and your no. your genuine interest? No, in no. It was like my organization. Um, the the. Or my employer is the Human Rights Foundation. I've been working there since 2007, and our, our focus is to help people live under authoritarian regimes around the world. Um, and one of the events we run is called the Oslo Freedom Forum, which is a series of conferences and, and private gatherings. And we did a gathering a few years ago um, for the Arab world, and Fadi was part of that. And um, we created a space where uh, Arabs from... I mean, I think there were people from there from more than 15 countries in the Arab world, um, ranging from Oman to Morocco. Um, they all came and hung out for several days together and traded notes. And, you know, um, it was it was all a private event. It was not, you won't find any public record of it. And, and we want to keep it that way. But the point is that through gatherings like this, um, I met I met Fadi. And then only later, um, you know, did, did the Bitcoin piece start to work its way in. I mean, again, I've been doing my work since 2007. I didn't really start to look at Bitcoin as, and, and actually money itself as, as an important part of the human rights uh, discourse until 
around 2017, early 2017 is when I really started to look at it carefully. So for the last five years, I've been increasingly interested in it because I find that money uh, is, is increasingly uh, relevant to the human rights struggle. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you mentioned the Oslo um, uh, Free, Freedom Forum. Um, the, you, that that's been an annual. From what I understand, it's an annual event. It brings mm-hmm. world leaders from around the country. You you had one of those events in San Francisco. We did. Um, I want to say around five years ago, something, something like that. And it, uh-huh. I was going to say it's a it's a place where people can brainstorm out of you know say public view, but in a it's like in a concentrated way, in a completely concentrated mm-hmm. way. We're, we're we're down to a few more minutes, so. Let, let me just ask you, uh, you and Fadi if you have any final thoughts, uh, maybe on the future of Bitcoin, maybe um, you know on the political aspects of, of digital currencies. Anything you want to offer, um, you know, to, to people as we cl- close up the uh, program today? Well, let I'll let Fadi have the last word. I'll just say that um, people want monetary independence, and if you're Palestinian, it's not on the table. Like it, at best, it'd be years away years away. And even if you got it, would it really be any good? Um, that's not, it's not clear. Like, can the PA really operate a currency that is going to be strong and is going to be good money for you and your family? <laughs> that's seems unlikely. Um, but the point is that the Palestinians deserve their own currency. They shouldn't have to use the Israeli currency. It's ridiculous. Um, but th- there's, there's no way out. And the same can be said for people around the world. I did another piece on, uh, 180 million people who still live in 15 African countries that still use the French currency. The French still control all of their economies. It's called the CIFA, the CFA franc. And um, it's the same thing with them. Their rulers are in in a cooperation with the French to keep this currency system going in exchange for power. You could say the same thing about the PA. I mean, the Israelis essentially hire the PA (laughs) to to rule this area for them Um, in in a, I guess, very boiled down sense. That's a similar idea. Um, And there's just no real opportunity for whether it be citizens of Togo or Senegal uh, or Palestinians to have a voice. They can't like participate in that um, structure. It's not fully democratic. So they have no way of pushing back. So what are they going to do? Their options are to do nothing or they can use Bitcoin. They can opt out into a new system that their government doesn't control. And yes, it has its risks and its ups and downs. Um, But the important thing is it has way more ups than downs and that people in emerging markets who've been using Bitcoin have have really, I mean, in some cases have had their lives saved. I mean, if you're thinking about a country like Cuba or Iran or Lebanon, where the the value of your, whether it be pesos or real or or lira, you know, pounds, et cetera, has has gone, you know, has lost 90, 90 plus percent of its value over the last few years. Okay. Some of these countries, Bitcoin has increased in value a tremendous amount so the difference could not be more stark it you know i find that store of value is not really a good accurate term for bitcoin it's actually a dramatic appreciator of value for you like you put in a certain amount of work and it grows like a tree it may not do that forever but at least we're now we're we're, the reality is we're in bitcoin's adoption cycle right now as a technology and there's only we're only at about two percent of the world population so as we go from 2% to 50% over the coming decade, its value is going to go way up versus the dollar. And it won't be, a vol- it, will, it will definitely be volatile. There will be crashes, of course. But you have to know that each crash is higher than the previous ceiling of the previous bubble, right? So that's if you just look at this thing. Um, and that's because there's a vast human desire for money that's beyond control of government, like that, that is something that humans want at, a, at an innate level. So I don't think this thing's going to be stopped. And I think it's a beautiful technology that's a technology of peace. And I want to uh, help Palestinians and Israelis and everyone else learn about it as much as I can, which is why I've had a lot of my translation put into uh, Arabic. The article that we referenced here today is available in Arabic and Hebrew. Um, It's something that Israelis can actually contribute to. There are a lot of Israelis who do not approve of the policies of their government and they protest all the time. Well, guess what? Here's here's like an actual way to protest. Something that I find frustrating is is the sort of like hashtag activism, like what like free Palestine. Okay, what's that going to actually do for anybody? Like, thank you, but like it's not really helping. If you teach a Palestinian how to how to be their own bank and how to actually use Bitcoin to receive money from abroad, you're making a meaningful upgrade in freedom for their life. So I think that this is like bigger than just activism. This is something 
quite real. And I'm very, very happy to have had the opportunity to talk to you uh, about it here, especially to, to join Fadi. So th thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Um, you know, the, the purpose of knowledge is not just knowledge, is action, right? This is a common saying that we all agree with. And um, I've learned most of what I know about Bitcoin, which is, you know, very little from um, Alex and, and the different um, workshops that he's done for people like me who are interested um, in human rights, uh, in the anti-corruption space. And in a normal world, I believe that the current Palestinian government would be the right body uh, to say that we would adopt cryptocurrency Bitcoin as the legal tender for us to circumvent all these different um, restrictions. But given their corrupt status, uh, we're not in a you know we're not in a perfect world. I do, however, would like to push, um, well, you know, everyone who's watching and others who are working on the Palestinian-Israeli issue to think of a body that would adopt. Uh, that is independent, that is focused on uh, development uh, for the Palestinians and the Israelis that would adopt uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as, um, as the legal tender to circumvent not just corruption, not just economic restrictions, but also to encourage people from all throughout the world to feel they're able to contribute without the, the stigma that comes or the fear that comes uh, of wanting to help the Palestinians uh, develop the, you know, the, the land and the country. Um, again, thank you, Alex, and, and thank you, Jonathan, for making oh, this possible. Uh, one, one more little Easter egg we'll leave for your listeners. Uh, El Salvador, which um, in Spanish means the savior, just just as an FYI, uh, uh, the president of El Salvador, who, who we could debate some other time, uh, what's ironic and what a lot of Palestinians actually seem to realize is that he's Palestinian. He's of Palestinian descent. So I don't think it's any coincidence that the first country in the world to adopt Bitcoin, uh, that decision was made by somebody of Palestinian origin. I think that's actually quite interesting and powerful. And maybe we'll leave it with that from our side. Thank you very much for having us. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah and I, I also want to uh, throw in my thanks, and this is where we're going to end the program. I want to thank uh, Fadi El Salamin and Alex Gladstein for participating in today's program, which is called Bitcoin and Release. And I want to thank those who watched the program I'm Jonathan Curiel, and now this virtual meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, celebrating over 117 years of enlightened discussion, is adjourned.